Hello and welcome to The Review, the podcast where we sit down with your favorite Kendama players over a cup of coffee and dive deep into this game we all love, because Kendama is more than just a ball in a cup. I'm your host, Adam, and today I'm really excited to welcome to this episode one of Kendama's greats, one of Kendama's legends, Daniel Robinson, aka D. As this is being recorded on a Saturday Eve, though, I am not drinking coffee. So I apologize to all of you guys out there that, you know, expect that coffee every week. But today and tonight, I am drinking a different kind of beverage, a good old gin and tonic. I got my tonic water here to top my, myself up as we keep going. But if you are tuning in and listening to this on a Monday morning or at an hour of day where it's acceptable and, and encouraged to drink a cup of coffee, I highly recommend checking out Onyx Coffee Lab. Honest Coffee Lab is a generous supporter of the review, and they make fantastic coffee. And so many of you guys have already been using their coffee, tagging me in your stories of you guys getting your orders. Seriously, I think over 80 people have now ordered through the review discount code. So thank you guys so much. That goes a long way to supporting the show and the amount of coffee that comes in. And we're going to be doing lots of giveaways of free Onyx here soon because of how much support and how much love you guys have for the brand already. So huge props to Onyx. I'm always repping them because I literally have so much merch from them now. They are the bomb. Here's what I do love about them if you don't know. Uh, they are a coffee company all about the art and science of coffee. They do a ton of great roasting and have won many, many roast championships as well as barista championships and for good reason. Uh, beyond their coffee taste and flavors that they have, which are great, they are a uh, coffee company that's really upfront about all of their values, their ethics, and where they source it from. So if you want to go check out their sustainability report, go ahead to onyxcoffeelab.com and check out that report. You can see where they get their packaging, compostable mailers, and everything down to how much they pay for their beans. So they give a really vulnerable look at the brand themselves. Uh, beyond that, you guys can go and support me. Go support Onyx Coffee Lab and drink better coffee by using code BREWVIEW10 when you shop today. Or just click the link in the description down below. It all goes to help the show and keeps me caffeinated. So thank you guys so much. And I want to get Dan on here real quick and dive in because I am quite giddy and eager for this conversation because I think Daniel Robinson is someone that we all need to get to know a little bit better in the Kendama community. So Daniel, uh, you want to jump on here and let's dive into this week's review. Daniel. Adam, Adam, so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. How, how was my intro? <laughs> it was fantastic. It, it was absolutely fantastic. I think it was a great delivery. <laughs> covered all the covered all the necessary points I, I try to I, I try to keep them short sweet but filled with good content you know <laughs> nailed it it was fantastic man thank um, you again so much for having me on dude I feel like this has been a long time coming I know that I've seen you in the preview chats before I know that you you've listened to some episodes and I know that you have played a really pivotal role in building Kendama into what it is today both in your play style and how you grew the game as one of the original innovators in the game growing the game by play. But now today, you're actually doing a lot behind the scenes that I don't think a lot of people recognize or know. And I want to dive into that today. Because uh, I remember you sent me a message a couple, you know, what was it like two months ago, asking me for details about last year's brew battle. And I still don't even know what's going on there. But I know you're working on something. And so hopefully I can mine at that a little bit uh, later in the episode today. <laughs> um, but before we get too deep, uh, it is a Saturday here. It is August 14th, and we are tuning in at 7.30 my time, and what, 6.30 your time? Yep. Where, where are you based out of? Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Washington. Yeah. Have you be been there forever? Okay. Well, almost forever. Uh, I lived here for about uh, 23, 24 years, and then uh, as many of our listeners may be familiar with, I moved to Colorado for about three years. Uh, and then after that, I moved back here and I've been here ever since. So um, with the exception of those three years, I've, I've lived most of my life here in Spokane, Washington. Beautiful, beautiful Pacific Northwest. Yeah, absolutely. I had been to the Pacific Northwest for the first time. Well, not the, quite the first time. I'd been to Chilliwack and Abbotsford in the lower mainland of BC mm. uh, like a couple of years ago. But I just went to my first fan jam. Like, what was that? Three, two, what, three, four? almost a month ago now, roughly, yeah. I was there. And oh my gosh, it's so beautiful in that part of the world where mm. it's just tropical, humid, the greenery is everywhere. And there's just huge, it's, it's absolutely stunning. It, it assume, really is. Is Washington pretty similar? You've been, you've been to, to Vancouver. Is yeah. Pretty comparable. 
It, it is actually, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, Washington, there's a reason they call it the evergreen state. Uh, it, it's just very lush and um, it, it, it's most of the houses here in Spokane um, have at least one or two just giant trees in the front yard or the backyard or somewhere. It's like the city was built kind of in this forest. Um, it, and one of the, the funny things was, and it, it's something that I, I didn't really realize until I left Washington for a little while. Uh, when I came back from Colorado just to visit for the first time, the first thing I really noticed was the air. And when I landed and I stepped outside for the first time, I never really noticed it before, but you just get this almost like seaside sort of scent to it. This like really fresh evergreen seaside blend that I really just didn't realize before until I lived somewhere else where it was different. And, you know, that sense of smell can bring back a, like a lot of uh, memories. It can evoke a lot of memories and just evoke a lot of things. It's one of your essential senses, you know? So um, totally. there, there's a lot of incredible parts about Washington. There's a whole psychology about that too, that you can like implement into studying and stuff. It's called hooking, like uh, aroma hooking or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. uh, people would uh, practice for tests and they'd chew like mint gum or something like that while they're doing their studying for it. And then when they'd go into an exam, they'd also chew that mint gum because it would help stimulate that part of the brain that was working while they were studying to increase recollection. Uh, and it and it's like a, a strategy that people will use. Uh, you know, people will do it with like all sorts of aromas, like a cinnamon stick or like essential oils or whatever they use. Uh, you can you could do a whole bunch of different stuff for that, like psychological hooking, uh, creating a habit. It, it's fantastic. But Very also like that state, like, you know, memory of like, oh, the aromas, of the forest and stuff. That's sick. That's oh, absolutely. Cool. Um, before uh, we get into my original three questions that I always like to ask before we dive in, uh, you you've been in Spokane for a little while now, but let, let's get this out of the way. What do you what do you like more, Spokane or Colorado? Rado, Rado. How do you? What's the right? Colorado, Colorado. Okay, that is an interesting one. Um, as a state, as a whole, I prefer Washington. Um, you know, it's it's hard to make comparisons like that nowadays because I was a I was a different person when I was living down there. So at the time, that's the more that's the environment I really preferred. But you know, with my the current being that I am, I, I'd probably have to go with Spokane. Um, you know, it's just as time goes on and things change and your priorities change and you just change as a person maybe that that decision would have been different years and years ago or maybe even not so many years ago but I'd, I'd go with Spokane on that one it is it's a nice home and Washington is a is a great state to be in and and it's a great state for Kanama there's so many great Kanama players from Washington oh man there's there's a lot of them here. There's, <laughs> well, we'll, yeah. we'll dive into that, I think, in a little bit, because I imagine that played a little bit of your role in your development. And, and I imagine you've also played a role in that development in, in Spokane, or at least in Washington in general. Yeah, uh, pos in possibly. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I like to ask three questions to every guest that comes on here in season two. And they're pretty simple. Uh, maybe you remember them, maybe you don't. But uh, uh, let's start with number one and then we'll work our way down the three and then we'll, we'll dive into our broader conversation here today. Uh, I always want to know, what are you drinking today as you join the boutique? I told our listeners already, I'm drinking a gin and tonic because it's way too late for coffee, but what are you drinking? Well, tonight uh, I am drinking the Equal Exchange Fairly Traded Coffee. It's uh, some <laughs> organic... <laughs> You're, you're, you're one-upping me here. You're drinking <laughs> coffee. <laughs> hey, I wouldn't turn down a nice gin and tonic either. I mean, that's <laughs> that's definitely sounds equally good. But yeah, in, in the spirit of the review, I'm having a nice uh, hot cup of coffee. Well, I might have to go down and make a cup right now and come back. I'm getting I'm getting beat, beat here. <laughs> beat at my own game. <laughs> it's your call, but nah, you no, could. We're, we're good. <laughs> I, I would have... I, Okay, so I found this out like not that long ago, but there, there's people that just assume that I like only drink coffee or drink like an obsessive amount of it. I, I love coffee, but I actually don't drink 
that much of it. Like I don't mm. drink like four or five, six cups a day. Like I think some people assume I do. I drink like maybe two cups at most in a day. And if I drink it after 2 PM, I sleep terribly. So mm. I like try to keep all my coffee in the morning and I try not to drink more than two cups. Uh, but if I'm going to drink only two cups of coffee, I want to make sure it's two really good cups of coffee. So I, 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 I trade quality over the, the quantity of coffee. Yeah. I, uh, not me. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will put, put cups down. No problem. 6 30. That sounds like a fantastic time for a cup of coffee. You know what yeah. though? I, I really could have made coffee though. Cause I have a decaf blend from Onyx that they sent me. Uh, and I just always like assume decaf's not going to be very good. So I never make it. Uh, but mm. I have, I have like two, two things of decaf coffee that I should make. I you know, have done that for tonight. but you know, here's the thing is, is during the work week, Monday through Friday, that's more often, at least on my end, that's more often than not iced coffee throughout the week, work week. Um, because if I'm at work and stuff like that, I just kind of want to be able to sip something here and there as I'm going, not really have to worry. You know, it's cold. It's, you know, even if it's not as cold as it was in the beginning, it'll still taste fine. Hot coffee, on the other hand, I usually save for the weekends uh, because... You know, not even for the mornings on a work day? No. Um, and the, the main reason being is just because with a hot cup of coffee, I'm not going to go as far as saying I'm like an aficionado or a connoisseur of coffee, you know, not at all. But yeah, I like the stuff for sure. And when it's the weekend, it, there's something about being able to like enjoy the coffee at your own rate and being able to just kind of pace it as you want to pace it. And that's like the main reason that I drink the hot coffee on the weekend cold coffee is because I'm on someone else's schedule. You know what I mean? But the weekends, hot coffee, I can take my time. I can enjoy this. Sit on, sit on the porch, look out into the green state, you know? Yeah, enjoy exactly. It. Exactly. You know, oh, so that that's kind of my approach. I can appreciate that. I made a nice cup of coffee this morning and sat on my back porch while, while on a phone call with, with a friend uh, who's getting ready to leave the country here soon for a while. And it was just so therapeutic to just sit there with my cup of coffee while having a conversation. I, I genuinely like the review is so life-giving to me because that is that is like the thing that I love about life is just having a warm cup of coffee and having a conversation with someone. It's like the mm. walls start coming down. You can just, you know, ease into a good conversation, get to know someone and learn something from someone. And it's so beautiful. It's like one of my favorite things in the world. You know, you, you get the opportunity to speak to like-minded individuals, but that are still very diverse people. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the most fantastic parts about, it's podcast in general, but specifically Kendama podcast is that you get that, that perfect balance of like-mindedness and diversity. And it, that's just such an enjoyable thing. And it really, it really humanizes a lot of people where it's very common in Kendama culture. And it's been like this since at least way before, even when I started playing Kendama, but it's been very internet oriented where you communicate through different, um, platforms or what have you and that's how you get to sort of know people conversations like this gives a voice to what otherwise were just words on a screen and that is a really refreshing thing to see and I think it's a it's an incredible way to contribute to our community and just communication in general is just such a great thing to establish and and opening that narrative is so essential um so definitely applaud uh, you and, and Rodney and uh, Bevel's Advocate uh, um, and others who paved the way for this. Uh, opening the door for communication among Konamo players is a fantastic thing. Yeah, I, I think it's super important and essential. I mean, uh, I had Rod and uh, Brian and like the cat, the, the hosts of both the, the podcasts in, in total, like Rod, MJ, Brian and... and Oh gosh, I'm gonna forget his name, and he's gonna to listen to this. <laughs> we got Tony Stabile, T Tony, uh, Tony. Yep. Um, and and just chatting with them about it, and it's like this is the type of like communication that any you know niche sport or any niche culture kind of needs because it it deepens the relationship to the game or the sport or the you know the community that you're a part of beyond just the task itself, right? It begins to connect you to the humans that are doing it more than mm -hmm. just the doing of the action itself. So I think it's super cool and super important. And I kind of stumbled into it and I like don't regret it at all because it's been 
such a fun journey for me. And I've got to have amazing conversations with people I never thought I was going to get the privilege to, to be in a room with or chat with or, or have that experience with. And I'm, I'm like forever grateful for it because it kind of happened without it happened with a lot of effort, but like not a lot of intentional effort where I was like, I have a goal that I'm going to do this. It was just kind of mm. like it happened and it was so organic and, I, and I'm really pumped about it. Really pumped. The, the, those are the best when, when it's just, you let the creative process take over um, and you let the project guide you instead of you kind of having the idea, maybe ideas, but not a, a centralized one. And I, I love that. That that's fantastic. I, I love that the idea of letting the creative process take the wheel and and direct you to what you're doing next. Yeah, it's a, it's liberating. It's it's refreshing. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two more questions, and then we'll we'll dive into your story because I really want to get into your story today uh, because I think it's one that I don't know if it's been told a whole lot. Uh, you've been on the Dominators before in past, uh, from my recollection, right? I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure I've, I've listened to your episode, but it was so long ago that so much of that is foreign to me now that I need to like rehash a little bit of that in this conversation today, but we'll hopefully dive into a lot of new topics. Uh, so if you guys are listening and you want more Debro content, go listen to the Dominards episode. Uh, from every episode they do is fantastic. And I'm sure this, that one was great because I listened to it and I, I keep <laughs> listening. So uh, anyways, uh, if you could teach any one person their first spike, uh, past or present, alive or dead, who would it be? Oh boy, that's a tough one. I'd have to really, really think about that one. It it would probably have to be like an ancestor of mine or something. That's that's kind of instinctually where my mind goes. Somewhere back in my ancestry, teach someone their first spike though i'm sure they already knew how by the time i got there <laughs> you know what you mentioning that's really interesting because i haven't really thought about this but in north america specifically we don't really have multi-generational kanama yet like maybe a, a couple like pieces but like jake weens just had his kids and you know they're maybe handling a kanama now and you know matt sweets and stuff but like there isn't a lot of multi-generational kanama in north america yet. i'm sure there is in japan a lot more Mm-hmm. but but not in north america at all i haven't really seen that do you know well, anyone that i can that you can think of well i guess uh well <laughs> uh for i hate i you know i'm gonna be honest man <laughs> i honestly hate sometimes just like talking about myself <laughs> i you know like there's something about that where it's just like god this guy <laughs> you know what i mean but i'm gonna do it so my great great grandmother uh was a kendama player what and she was actually born in hatsukaishi um hiroshima which uh is the birthplace of kendama and when i i I told this story briefly on the dama nerds uh podcast but just to share it with you as a little refresher um yeah she was a kendama player and when i revealed that over in 2014 uh, at the 2014 kendama world cup um, it was, uh, it was, uh, they were pretty surprised to, to hear that, um, that that's where my family was from and no one in my family, uh, specifically my mother, who's Japanese was really too surprised when I brought a Kanama over for the first time because they're like, oh yeah, great grandma Hamamoto was insane at that thing. <laughs> so, uh, in that's some amazing. ways, in some way, shape, or form, um, I think it, it did get passed down. And then now that I have my uh, first child, Dot, um, she's definitely showing an interest in the Kendama. That's um, so amazing. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. That's pretty, that's pretty fun. <laughs> my, my grandparents were farmers, and I haven't touched a land of crop in years. That's okay. Nothing passed down from them to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay Dude, but it's so cool so you know the the opportunity to continue the kanama lineage is definitely still there and um so you know so you know kind of back to the original question um i i guess like something like that would just mean more to me to just be able to go back and and see someone from 
my my family's past and have the opportunity to to do that and in the back of my mind think that this was like somehow in some way shape or form connected to things to come later on so um i guess that would be my answer to that one awesome i love that that's so cool uh who is the most inspiring kanama player to you today not of all time but like you know recently who's kind of the one that inspires you the most right now oh man <sighs> yes the hard hitting questions <laughs> yeah this is a this is a tough one man because there there are some players that i always am gonna just be fanboying from now until the very end so like okay so nowadays and this this kanama player always inspires me always gets me stuck to play kanama that's chris june um chris june fantastic human being fantastic kanama player love his style love his approach to the game um i just love his his perspectives and the way that he sees Kendama and culture as a whole. And, um, you know, I just love his, his tricks are just nasty, man. Like they're just so nasty, but they look so effortless, uh, effortless. And I, I love that. Um, so Chris June is always a big, big inspiration for me. Um, it, it, it's tough because inspiration uh, kind of spawns in different ways with, with Kendama, you know, certain players inspire you to do different things and inspire you to try different things. It's, it's a tough one. And every time I, I pick up the Kendama, it's, um, it's just kind of like, I don't really know what's going to happen when I pick this thing up. I don't really have a, I don't ever really have like a set thing of like, this is what I want to practice. This is what I want to do. I kind of just, let go and whatever starts happening starts happening um i guess one other player that's definitely worth mentioning um i've known this guy for a long time and even just the smallest little glimpse of kanama play from him gets me so hyped up and that's sam cannon um some of you may be familiar with sam cannon if you aren't you need to become familiar with sam cannon and go buy his um, mod and go by his mod uh he's uh, again incredible human being and in my opinion one of the greatest kanama players of all time like i'll say 100 percent with I'm, confidently I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure bray will always say sam cannon's like his favorite player of all time there you go i mean i mean it's just he's just incredible hey, he's just one of those players that you can play kendama with and you can just scheme whatever trick especially if it's like a lunar oriented one and you can just be like sam bang this thing out and it's like a it's like a 95 percent success rate <laughs> like it's it's absolutely insane uh yeah he's just one of those those kendama players that uh you know his energy and just his um technical ability and just how advanced his maneuvers are just really get you get you hyped on kendama absolutely where, absolutely where's, where's sam from so sam um i believe it was originally um, maple falls washington i believe is where he was originally from but then he lived a long time over in sandpoint idaho right. um which is about two hours two and a half hours away from spokane um and now i believe he's living in ohio i think that is where he is now but he's he's been posting a little bit here and there and that's just oh just so good to see yeah, that's awesome i am actually so excited uh, about chris june because he's coming out to brew battle this year and i'm incredibly excited to meet him and, and hang out with him i've seen him in person i think at nato maybe twice now but i've never had a, an opportunity to like chat with him and so i found out tara's bringing him up to to the event couple weeks here and i'm just so geeked there's so many cool people coming but chris is one of the guys i'm really excited about meeting just because i've never met him before and i'm hoping to get him on kind of a preview podcast uh, here soon or doing something with him at the event just because i want to try and get as much cool content or audio content with you know the people that are showing up at the event so chris is one of the people i'm really looking forward to meeting yep absolutely he seems like a, a beauty of a guy yeah so Okay, Daniel, uh, let's dive in here into some of the, the talking points that I want to jump through a little bit today and kind of just guide us through a story of, of what your life has looked like in Kanama uh, and what you've been up to. And more, you know, we'll, we'll lead into a little bit of what's going on today in your world and what your involvement looks like now. But 
I am curious, and I know you've probably dove into this a little bit in the past, but where did Kanama begin for you? And what were you doing before Kanama entered into your life? Kendama, so I I was first introduced to Kendama in the year of 2010. Um, probably about June or so. I would say like, yeah, June or so is when I first got introduced to Kendama. And um, like many other people, uh, my group of friends was just playing and I was the last one to hop on board. Um, and uh, not to repeat myself too much from what I've said on, on Dominards previously, but one of, the, one of the big things that I noticed about the Kendama as soon as I saw it, I was like, that thing is right up your alley. You cannot touch it. Do, do you were not. afraid you were afraid it, of it. it in some way shape or form i mean that's not uh, too I, out, I actually out, have sympathized with that a little bit you know I, like i i get that you know oh go ahead I, I i hardcore sympathize with that where there's things that i've seen in my life and and this was a scary moment for me with climbing because i've been getting into that recently where i my colleagues had started going and they're like oh you should come and i said I don't know, because I know if I go, I'm going to love this thing. And then it's mm -hmm. going to become something that takes over my life. And I'm going to put a lot of money and effort and energy into this thing. Am I ready for that commitment? And I was, so I dove in, but, but I, I can sympathize with that. Like I see things in my life all the time. Where I'm like, I know I could be good at that. And so I have to not do that thing because of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and that was... That was one of the things that ran through my mind. And, and, you know, I'm sure there was some part of me that was like, oh, all my friends are doing it. I want to be the lone wolf. Like, you know, I want to be different and not play with it. And then eventually I caved. And then in August 2010, uh, I got my first blue TK16 Kendama. And it was, that was it from there, man. Um, I, I just couldn't put the thing down. Um, played uh, for about three years um, before I was sponsored by Kendamico. Moved to Colorado, spent three or so years down there as a sponsored player, um, and then moved back about 2016, 17 time. And just haven't um, had any sponsors or direct affiliations since then. And um, Nowadays, I've just been kind of working on some, some other things. So is that why you moved to Colorado was because of the sponsorship? Yeah, I, uh, I moved down there to actually work for Konamico. Okay. Um, yep, what, they, what was that like? Like what, what, what was that whole process of moving down there? And what was your role uh, going to look like working for Konamico? It was when I first got the opportunity, I was like, you know, this is something that not a lot of people ever get the chance to do you there's no way i was going to turn it down i there was absolutely no way um i had never lived anywhere other than spokane at that point too so it was like, how, how old were you at the time Sorry to cut I, I was about 23 um yeah. maybe 24 at the time but yeah probably closer to 23 and um so when i moved down there um i worked there as the general manager um uh, my bosses were Sam and Lex Ullman. They were the co-owners of the company. And um, I had some co-workers, Chris Bosch, Chris Rodriguez, um, and a few others join down the road. And uh, it was, it was an incredible experience, honestly. Um, there was a, there was a lot of stuff that happened towards the end, but all in all, it was an incredible experience. Um, working in that industry, working in, in the toy industry in general is such a pleasure. Like it is just so fantastic. It, it, it preserves your youth in a way. And at Konamico, we maybe were preserving a bit too much of our youth, but, <laughs> um, it was, uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, and something that I, I wouldn't, I, 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 there was no way I was going to let that opportunity pass by. And then years down the road, look back and be like, man, I should have done that. Um, so it, um, all things considered, it was, it was an incredible experience. And I think for a lot of us, like there's this veil over Kenko in its history for a lot of us. I mean, some of it's obviously been talked about in multiple places, even here on the review and the past 
services. But, um, you know, talk me through a little bit about what it was like working for Kenco. What was kind of the, the Kenama company at the time? How big was it? Like, how big of a deal was Kenco in terms of like the reach that it had? Was it making like tons of sales and just expanding and expanding and expanding? Like, what kind of an environment was it like behind the scenes? So Konamico was very, a very personality oriented company. That was a huge thing for it. And you, you even see it now and, and really like any company you can think of has a personality, but we'll, for the sake of simplicity, like we'll just focus on Kendama companies. And as far as like company personalities, I would say Kendamico's was definitely the most um, kind of eyebrow raising um, in terms of maybe um, approaches to tricks or and just kind of the mentality and the type of content. It was just, uh, it was different than the other, I would say other, you know, three, four, maybe five other big personalities in the community at the time. Going, working for Konamico was, <laughs> it was a blast, man. It was a blast. It was, there was a lot of good times. And at times it was really, really frustrating. And at times it was just, you know, it's sometimes it's like hard to put into words, but it's just like it, you think of a situation that's almost too good to be true. And that's kind of what it was. <laughs> But for the time that it was true, it was just, it was so much fun, man. And um, as, as far as like, so as far as sales and things like that went, um, it wasn't by any means this huge beast in the industry. I think like more so than anything was that Konamico was a big personality in the, in just, in the industry. It had a big reputation, like it had, yes. had all the big names attached to it. Yeah, I mean, the Kendamas were good by the standard at the time, and um, the colorways and things like that were pretty slick, um, but the, it was definitely the personality that caught people, and especially kind of back in this time where uh, the, the broader audience was a little different. Um, nowadays, when I think about it, I'm like, mm, maybe maybe the co was just a couple years too early with some of their antics and some of their approaches to things. And there, there were a lot of reasons why it's not here today, but um, I, I, I really did like the way that that company carried itself most of the time. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, you, you've described it as being like a different kind of personality. How would you, how would you define the personality of if, if you if you had words to define it like what what was the personality of it kenko was was uh it was a mixture of a few different things it was a mixture of uh, how do i articulate this in the most accurate way punks isn't really the right word but we were kind of punks like <laughs> We were kind of, we were, we were kind of like little punks at times. Who was and all on the team when you joined? Like, so who, who was when, there? so there was a, quite a few. So on the pro team, um, joining me was Bonds, Chris Bosch, Jake Fisher, Sam Cannon. Um, there's later Matt Dakota. Um, you know, Chris June was there. Steph Lucier, Ernie. Anxia, um, Caleb, Jeffries, Elijah Lane, Andres Chacon. There, there's a lot. That's a lot there, more than I than I always like remembered it being. This yeah. was a lot. Yeah, that that was back in after the original 2013 sponsorship uh, results, where they they had the oh Jake Fisher, yeah. Um, the, the video, <laughs> of, video of course, I would right? forget. Of course, I, I forget. Fish. No, no, no. You, you said fish. You said fish. Oh, uh, did I? Yeah, 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 you did. Fish, you afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was a uh, that was like right after the 2013 sponsorship contest. Um, and I remember even a few people joking about how many people got sponsored. But um, yeah, the squad rolled deep at one point. Absolutely. Yeah, 
and, and really, I think it paved the way for a lot of other brands in kind of that, that new gen style of marketing now that a lot of canonic companies use, which is you know, sponsorship. Uh, Kengo is kind of the, one of the first brands really sponsoring players. I think at the time, maybe Kusa also was kind of getting into that space. And I don't know if Sweets was there yet. Uh, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I wasn't that playing at that time. The 2013, um, that was actually, so those sponsorship contests actually happened pretty, pretty close together. Um, so it was kind of like, um, it, it, if my memory serves correctly, I actually think the 2000, I think the sweets contest happened and then the Konamiko contest happened, mm-hmm. um, about 2013, which is the year that Max joined. I believe it was 2013. That's right. Yeah. 20, 2013, I think was the year Max joined. Yeah. So that was, so it was actually uh, right about the same time. Um, and then Konami USA had their tribute team and their pro team. Um, a couple other little brands here and there had some, some sponsorships uh, or some sponsored players. And I think like one of the big things too about Kendamico in terms of like sponsorships was that there were a lot of gnarly Kendama players on Kendamico at one point. Um, you know, even factor me out of the equation, there were some absolutely phenomenal Kendama players in its prime, in its heyday. Kendamico's squad was just absolutely stacked. And that was one of the things that honestly kept Kendamico going was there were plenty of other talented Konami players sponsored by other Konami companies. Absolutely. No doubt about it. But the Kenko squad was kind of an intimidating group to go against. If you were just like going one V one, because I mean, you had Bosch, you had bonds, you had fish, you had cannon, and then you still had June and Tana. Like you just had like all of these, these yeah. monsters at Kendama to go against. And like, that was honestly like a saving grace for Kendamaco that, that we kind of built this reputation of like, yeah, if you, if you play with Kenko, or if you want to play for Kenko, you got to be on some shit. And <laughs> everyone was. <laughs> and, it it and, was kind of a big deal to be on Kenko at that time. Like that was, I mean, was I mean, a big deal. That also makes me, it sounds like, <laughs> It kind of sounds like I'm building up this superiority complex around like the name of Konamiko because along with all of this, like Konamiko, like we were kind of degens, like, you know, we were like haggard and like, <laughs> we were just, you know, we were doing all sorts of goofy shit. Like, so I don't want to make it seem like we were this like elitist group of Kendama players, because if you, <laughs> if you met us, you were just like, Oh God, the co is here. So it was, it, it, it was a nice balance between the two. So I, I just need to clarify that for <laughs> sure, because yeah, that's. But, but that's it sounds like you genuinely had like a really great time as a part of Kenco and yeah. both as yeah. like a worker and as someone who you know was sponsored by the brand, you were obviously yeah. a player for the brand as well. Um, 100%. So, so what was it like for you when, and I don't, I don't know what the right words are, so I'm just gonna just gonna say like the collapse of Kenko or whatever you want to call it. Um, what, how did that hit you? Like, what, what was that like? That one cut deep. That was a tough one. That one. So and, you know how you kind and, of like. And, no, I was go gonna ahead, say go ahead. like if 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 you are comfortable or want to talk about it, you can talk about like maybe why or break down kind of like what you saw happening on the inside. Um, yeah, but sure. also like no, no, no need to totally your choice. <laughs> I, I, I think like really what it is, is these little details that happen throughout the story. Eh, everyone has kind of picked up these little details here and there, you know, some are true, some are not all these things. I think what's like, it, there's other things that are bigger that happened that led to this collapse that are more important than a lot of those little details. And this actually goes back into our conversation about company personality where that personality was like a saving grace for Konamiko for a while. But when the control shifted to someone else, that personality started to take a very big turn. And it, trying to take such a sharp turn in personality at the point the company was in, I think was too drastic. It was, it was trying to change change, uh, put on a different mask than what the company already had. And whether or not it would have made a difference in the end is neither really here nor there. But that is one big thing that I noticed um, working from the inside that 
in my humble opinion, led to at least some of the downfall of Kendamico. I mean, there's all these other logistics that go behind it. You know, he did this, he did that, all these sorts of things. What's really important to know is that the Kendamico was, it was kind of like the blind leading the blind. And we wrote it out for as long as we could. And in the end, that strategy and that approach, we, we attempted to change it uh, too little too late, unfortunately. But the impact that that company made, the, the silver lining is that, and this is what I said in the dominance was that it, it was both the best and the worst thing to happen to me. Because on the one hand, this company allowed me to literally live my dream for several years, doing something that I love to do, traveling, going to places that other people could only dream of going, you know, getting to learn uh, people in this community that I'm so, so passionate about. I mean, it was just, there's nothing greater for a 20 something year old at the time, you know? And then when I, when I say that is the worst thing is because those things were phenomenal life-changing and when it's all ripped away from you all at the same time it's kind of like you hear from the outside and you think okay well you should be thankful for all the things that happened and it's like yeah I was but I think I'm also allowed to be hurt and take as much time as I need to be hurt and I'll tell you this um, and I haven't really talked to a lot of uh, people about just kind of what was going on in my mind. But even before I started, before my departure, like with Kendamico, um, I I started to really, really have a lot of crazy, like I started to have these really like mental breaks, sounds like a little dramatic, but I really started to maybe think a little bit more than I usually do, which is already all the time. And that really started to wear on me. And when when it all kind of collapsed that was just like the breaking point and that basically caused me to go into hiding for the next about two or so years and i was always like playing kendama but i was wasn't really posting much if at all you know maybe like less than half a dozen a year you know and um I was just more focused on lurking and just kind of regrouping, reassessing, realigning, and just taking some time. And um, after all that, um, after all that time away, I, I re-entered and I was like, that was the right decision to take that time away. Um, so the long and short of it all is that it was, it was a great experience. It was, it was a lot of hurt at the end there, but it, that that hurt is what makes you stronger and it makes you learn your lessons those those sorts of things that you really really get that hard reality check it's it's really only um it's really only helped me as a person uh ever since ever since that day for sure i think going through some sort of a challenge in your life however big or small generally depending on how we handle it like helps to shape us into a better version of ourselves Oh, yeah. I think what you did, you know, taking that time to to rest and to think and to dwell on it, you know, dissect it, whatever whatever terminology you want to use and, and evaluate, then re-enter later, is probably the healthiest thing you could have done at that time. I think some people, you know, when something terrible happens to them or or you know something that's hurt them deeply, their immediate reaction is, all right, let me bring all of my un unfiltered emotions and my feelings into the people around me or into that community as a retaliation instead of taking that time whether it's a few days or a week or in your case two years to to think and to dwell and to reflect and to ask yourself like okay i have been hurt um maybe maybe there's some learning there maybe there's some growing in myself that i needed to go through and that's not the case for everybody and you know the timeline is not the same for everybody but i think what you did there is is mature right (laughs) it's taking that opportunity to reflect and grow and then come back as something better Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, looking back on it all, it's like everything happened the way it should. Things tend to unfold just as they should. At least that's how it's been with my own personal experience. So I'm going to go ahead and keep following that. So so then what what was it like when you re-entered? Was that weird for you? Yeah. 
yeah, it was weird, <laughs> but it shouldn't have been. And I think it was only weird because I was thinking it was weird. And because what, what it, was weird? Like what, what were the things that made it feel weird? Okay. So like, here's what it is, is when you, especially coming from where I was, I was a resident of planet Kendama and planet Kendama is this cozy little space where Kendama players talk about Kendama and play Kendama and think about Kendama and eat Kendamas and drink Kendamas and everything that they do is about Kendama. All of the communication that they talk about, the, the language that they used, everything, it's all Kendama. So that's cozy little planet Kendama. And I lived there when I was working for Kendama Co. In fact, I had been living there for years before, back in 2010 basically is when I first signed my lease there. So you're in this like little cozy space of plant and Kendama. And then you've got like the real world over here on the other side. And it it's, it's weird because when you are living on planet Kendama and so much of your life focuses on it, there's not a whole lot of balance in your life. The scale is very tipped to one side where it's your, your passion. Now I think it's fantastic to follow your passions and your dreams and all that shit. I think that's fantastic, but I think that a balance is way more crucial to your overall well-being. So when you go from living on planet Kendama and being totally immersed and engulfed by this culture, then that gets cut, cut down in that one day. Now these two years go, you're kind of going through this weird phase of like getting completely cold turkey cut off, but it's kind of by your own choice as part of the, the healing process. So when I re-entered, it was weird because I personally felt like I, I've missed two years of these people's interactions and these relationships being built and relationships being broken and and this and stories to be had and to be told and when you were just living breathing that all the time and then you take such a far step back and then you come back in yeah it's gonna feel weird it's gonna feel weird for a little bit but despite how and i think that was all just up in my head because the kanama community is a very welcoming community especially especially people who've been playing for a long time and even you know and that's not to say that newcomers aren't welcoming of course they are most people are it's just um you know it's all up in my head uh and since then i think it, i think things have pretty much gone back to normal since then um but yeah, for, for a time there, I, I kind of felt like for the first time in a long time, I felt like a little bit of an outsider. Um, and that, that, that was an unusual feeling for me to have in terms of Kendama. Yeah, I can see that. And, and I'd imagine it, and maybe, and maybe it doesn't, but like from, from an outset, I could, I could imagine it might feel weird even still today. If you were, you were a sponsored player, were you, you were on the pro team for, for yeah. Kendama Co. And yeah. And and the, you know, one of the prominent brands, an icon of icons, and now today you're unaffiliated with any brands. And there's all these new players that are coming in that have never heard of Kenko, that have no idea who you are, and you know, you're just liking their posts or engaging or finding them. Does that feel weird that you helped build this world of a community uh, with your status, your influence, your tricks, whatever you want to call it? And then now it's like you get to observe all these new players coming in and experiencing it for their first time, and you aren't you know the person that they're seeing up on on the video or whatever it is you know what i here's the deal though when even when i was a sponsored player there were tons of people who still didn't know who i was which is <laughs> like which is which is completely fine i am totally okay with that and it's not like i was completely unknown but when you looked at kenko there were obvious headliners there were obvious like people who was like everyone knows who bonds is everyone knows who fisher is you know what i mean so i was like i, I never really was that widely known like i you know highly whatever person um so i guess it doesn't really like bother me too much that you know, people don't like know who i am or even know about kenko it's just like you know that's just opportunities to learn so it's i you know i can't really get on your case for <laughs> for not knowing about something that happened have a decade before you even heard about this thing yeah. you know so um 
Do you feel yeah. like you're you're still like an active, engaged participant in the new generation of, of players? Or or do you find yourself in kind of more of the observer category? Like, no, I've been here for a long time and I, I like to watch what's happening. Or do you like to find yourself engaging in what's happening there? It's a little bit of a balance. Every, everything that I do in Kendama and really in, in life in general after Colorado revolves around the idea of balance. So I think like in those categories, there's like always a nice middle ground to be found. And really just in basically everything, there's always a little middle ground to be found between two extremes. So, you know, I, I, I have done some classes with the Kanama, uh, the Sweets Kanama's Foundation um, with uh, Joshua Grove. And I've done some online classes with that. Uh, and that was a really great experience. And I feel like I was able to communicate with some of the more newer generation Kanama players through that. That's so um, cool also. Just as an aside, I think it's incredible that that exists. Like before, yes. you know, being called Kenoma Institute, Sweet Kenoma's Foundation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's amazing. Like it's really, really cool what has been built there and the work that you guys are all doing together collectively. And, and you know, and, and, and that's mostly Josh. That is like 99% like, Josh. And, and, Josh. and what I think it really is too is that that is contributing to our community in a different way than others are contributing to. You know, community is built on a very, very diverse group of people with different skill sets and and trade skills and all that all that good stuff so it's like uh, being able to contribute on that level is a really fantastic thing for our culture and for the game as a whole um so and then so to communicate with the new gen players um that's how i've primarily done it i've really just been more focused on in this last year of of sort of like rekindling um these narratives with with some of the, the the older generation of Kanawa players and just reconnecting with them and just being more proactive about um, reaching out and talking to them. And I, I'll pretty much just like call people up and be like, yeah, you have to answer because <laughs> it's me, you know? <laughs> like it was just, and it's man, just if like, I got a call from d I'd be picking up. <laughs> I do, well, it is just like, you know, you see me calling and you got to like look at your watch. You're like, ah, oh, dude, this is going to be like a 45 minute conversation. Do I have the time for this? And it's like, well, that's for you to decide, but I'm calling you either way. Um, and so just really like reestablishing those narratives and that, that um, communication uh, has been a lot more of my focus and then of course just kind of sprinkling in my my tricks here and there and uh not really as active on social media um unless it's either pictures of my kid or just a random kanama trick it's it's mostly lurking still but you know being a little bit more a little more active but i just lurking is just way more up my alley <laughs> there that's awesome um, kind of on the same topic, uh, you know, you've been playing Kendama for a long time. You've been engaged in the community a long time. And from the perspective of someone, you know, quote unquote lurking, um, you've got to see the Kendama generations evolve, you know, from you know, 2010 to, to really today. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd love your perspective on kind of the journey that we've been undergoing as a community to where we're at today. And, you know, what have you seen as some of the coolest developments and some of the areas of growth that we still have in Kendama as a, as a whole? So when I think of Kendama as a whole, and you, you think of, um, you can think of this as sort of like the lifespan or the timeline of Kendama, or like, let's specifically, you know, more specifically define it as Western Kendama, because there's, there's a very big differentiation between different regions about how this culture has changed over the years. So we'll focus on Western Kendama. So in the very beginning, and this is what I find like very interesting about Kendama and like on a more philosophical sense about life in general or whatever, I see Kendama as their, their timeline, not so much as like a straight linear thing, but as more of like a cyclical thing. And that in with what I mean by that is, you know, it starts to spiral and it starts to get wider and wider and wider. And that's more of how I see the life cycle of Kendama. Um, I think that things kind of tend to repeat themselves, but in a slightly different manner um, when new doors have been unlocked. And then, you know, like, let's just say a, a trick concept is, is introduced. So like you explore the trick concept, you start exploring all these like different options. 
something else is introduced and this meadow keeps going for a while until eventually you kind of end up back at the same point of like okay what's something else because now you have all the knowledge of that first little bit of the timeline now you're adding that on to the next one and that's just kind of like how i see it one of the things that i've noticed especially coming from my generation of Kanon players to nowadays is there is a very distinct change in play personality and how tricks are presented and thought of back in the day your tricks could be very good but what was more important is that your tricks were unique. It was always kind of that constant push to see who could introduce the next new thing or, you know, even just do something that someone hadn't already done. Now, granted, this was back in the day where not a lot of things had been done. So it's kind of makes sense as to why that was sort of the, the goal when you were filming content. Some of it, you know, there was obviously people who just want to have fun, but for the sake of this sort of tangent, we'll go with that. And nowadays, I see a lot less trick personality, but I see a lot more proficient technical skill. So you see a really big differentiation where it's like a little bit of the sacrifice of the personality, but in exchange, we're going to amp the difficulty of these tricks up quite substantially. Personally, you know I, I, I like not to cut you off, but like as you brought that up, I just started like thinking back through all the past pros of like Konami USA or whatever, and they all had very distinct styles of play and they had their own flavor to, to everything they did and they didn't seem to like compete or clash. But now when I'm thinking about it, like a lot of the new gen pros, they're all just competing at the same type of trick or the same concept. Yes. And it should, it is about who can do it the most or the best. It's not about who has the most steez while doing it. I, and, you know, that kind of dives into the idea of like the current trick meta and that, you know, that's just like this whole other can of worms that we could talk probably for an entire episode on. And, and I guess like for me, what it is, is it's very, very few times that Kendama players will ever want to perceive Kendama through a critical lens because we are a very positive and uplifting community. Um, and that's just kind of like part in the culture, part of the culture is to, is to, you know, even if, if a certain trick or Tama isn't your cup of tea, or in this case, cup of coffee, it's, you still kind of are like, Hey man, like that's sick. You know, you don't ever want to bring them down. So in those instances in which you're like, let's just take five seconds and look at everything through a slightly different lens, a more critical lens. That's when some more honest thoughts come out and that's really important. And if we're looking at it through that really critical lens, there's no doubt in my mind that these new generation tricks are just absolutely crazy. These things, the, the, the variants of Ken flips, then the interchangeable idea of juggles, taps, instances, and Ken flips, like the, the amount of options that you have with that is incredible. And the technical skill and timing and muscle memory required to do those tricks is absolutely outstanding however that shit gets boring after a while i'm just like i'll be honest because there's no doubt that it's impressive but it's just like i the, i'd be lying to say that i don't i do miss those that more personality oriented kendama style and you know it's not to discredit your technical ability but just i i want to see a little more originality i want to see more and does it really matter what i want to see no but if we're all just being honest with ourselves for five seconds here then we can go back to planet kandama i i just i'm, I'm just want to see some different stuff i think it probably stems a little bit from just this idea of like wanting to fit in rather than stand out like yeah, maybe so so many of us have a desire of being seen by the collective rather than standing apart from it and being being the one that everybody looks at and being like oh that person's unique and in all honesty like when i look at some of the, the most unique players i'm like those are the players that i really think are making an impact on the game the people that aren't conforming and i i love their styles i love the the work that they do with kanama like uh, there's a guy in in europe uh, i think Aust austria he plays for Do. Uh, 
Mr. Flox, and he has a mm-hmm. total different way of playing Kandama from everybody else in the game. And I'm like, that's so cool. I love what you're doing. And you're not just conforming. You're not adding, you know, you're not doing the same trick that that other pro did, but with an extra tap, you're completely changing the way I see Kandama. Yeah. And, and I, I think that those are the pros that I really look up to because they do shape the game like Ben Harold, right? Like now everybody's doing Ben Harold while Ben Harold's trying to figure out what the next Ben Harold is, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that's what separates some of these pros that I see from generic competitive players. It's like, mm-hmm. I think so many of us now, and I think this is actually a birthed out of the competitive nature that's grown into Kendama, like open divisions and competition play. It's like, we want to see comps grow. We want to see technical capabilities grow so that we can compete better. And I think that's where a lot of that conformity comes in is that I need to be good at all the tricks that everybody else does so that I can compete against them. And then there's other players that just don't care as much about competition and they're, they're changing the way. And, and I think mm-hmm. it's just two different mindsets that exist. And I think what you're saying and what I'm seeing as well is like less and less of that is happening and more and more of the collective like zeitgeist of, what's also what's also really worth noting about this entire topic is that the reason like one of the big reasons that this critical lens isn't used oftentimes in kendama is because we never want to discourage someone from playing kendama because my personal preference and what i like to see you know you can take that or leave it or do whatever you want with it i just want to like put it out there and be honest with it for a second the the fact of the matter is is that as long as you're playing kendama that's awesome that's all that matters that's that's the core of it and that's why that critical lens isn't used as often because you don't ever want to bash someone for you know doing a trick or is like you know you don't ever want them to feel like the tricks that they're doing aren't adhering to this unseen panel of kendama judges or whatever you know and and um i i just you know i think a little bit more of that sometimes brutal honesty can really help in the long run just just a little bit because there's always a balance to be found i i totally agree do you do you by chance know your personality type uh on like myers briggs or enneagram or like anything I did know for a while, um, but I can't quite remember. <laughs> I, I'm always I, curious. Uh, I feel like like people don't talk about it as much anymore, but I remember there was such a big deal. And I always come out on anyone is like, and I, nobody in Kendama would like probably call me out on this and, and unless you actually know me like Kareem. But I always come out as like the debater, the devil's advocate. I'm always trying to see things from like the opposite side of how everybody else sees it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the way I like looking at the world so I can get a holistic perspective of whatever the situation I'm looking at is. I don't want to just conform to like see it the way everybody else sees. I want to say like, oh, okay, let me just like jump to the other side. And it sounds like maybe you do that a little bit as well, where you you want to be critical and you want to ask the questions and, and be be there to observe from the outside and then look and, and then maybe come to your resolution later. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I think I, I hit a pretty healthy balance between um, knowing what I want, but at the same time, keeping an open mind, you know, there's, there's always that middle ground. Um, Because I I can, if I set my mind to something, and I want something done, like I I'm getting that shit done, because that's just (laughs) what I do. And I will keep an open mind. But (laughs) if something needs to get done, and it needs to get done in a hasty manner, then I will get it done. And that's just kind of, um, I mean, I, I'm an Aries, if anyone believes or wants to believe in, in astrology, more power to you. But that is one personality trait for me. Um, yeah, it can be a lot. I, I can definitely be a lot for some people, um, especially younger when I had a smaller brain and a bigger mouth. Um, but I, I, at least when people talk to me about Kandama, They know that anything that I'm going to say to them is coming from a genuine place because I I don't feel like it's fair for me to, to, to pander and just say things that people want to hear. And, and that, that in my mind is, is, is putting a filter on your own feelings and thoughts. And I think that there's a, there's always a way to, to put the appropriate amount of filter depending on the situation you know 
and, and that's what comes with maturity. Like you can be a critical person, but then also have that filter to know like when, when's the right time to be critical and when, yeah. when's the time, right and time place. to just be like, okay, great. Maybe my, my input in this moment isn't the right time to give my input on the situation because it's just not timely. And I think that's, that's where maturity comes in. And, and yeah. I'm not always the best at that, but I recognize that that's something I need to get better at. And I recognize that you can be critical and, and still be loved by people and appreciate mm-hmm. without coming across as an ass. Yeah. And it just, <laughs> we all got jobs to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let, let's take a couple of minutes. There's a few questions from people who submitted them on the IG story uh, beforehand. So let me uh, jump through a couple of these and then let's talk a little bit more about your role in Kanama today. And I want to dive into what you're doing uh, right now with a lot of this data that you've been mining and searching for. And I kind of want to get to know a little bit of what's going on in D Rose world today. That sounds good. Uh, well, this first one isn't actually a question, apparently. But uh, Kendrama.co wants me to boost the gain on the podcast because it's too quiet, apparently. Maybe turn up your volume. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and fix that for, for this episode. I'll, I'll turn it up. Can, you can hear me fine. I, yeah. I don't know why the audio doesn't. <laughs> I don't know what goes on. We'll figure it out. Audio engineering, man. If, you, if you're not an audio engineer and you want a, a, an unpaid volunteer experience job... <laughs> Hit me up. Opportunity of a lifetime. You, I'll, I'll give you show notes credit. <laughs> um, question here from Schneebs uh, underscore. Schneebs wants to know, what would you like to see more of from the Spokane community? Uh, and he says, I love you, Sensei. Yeah. James Schneebly, Schneebs, AK Schneebs. Oh, man. I, watching that guy grow as both a person and as a economic player over the years has really been, really been a treat. Um, it's been really nice seeing the Kanama, the Spokane Kanama crew, um, kind of get their wind back a little bit, uh, because for a long time, everyone was kind of just doing their own thing as life happens and priorities change. And, um, after this last year, because of, uh, lockdowns, um, it really sort of reignited a lot of the Kandama scene in Spokane, which is fantastic. Um, everyone kind of came out of hiding for a little bit. And, you know, for me personally, um, I, I really like how the Spokane crew has taken the initiative on hosting weekly jams throughout the summer on Saturdays. Um, sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they're bigger, but the point is that people come out and, and have a good time and just, and play Kendama. And that's, that's really, isn't that all we really want? And so, um, that's, um, that's really been great. I, I love to see, um, Obviously, I'd love to see more people kind of get back into it. It it had its really big spark and fade back in 2013 or so. And um, that'd be really great to see. But honestly, I think the the Spokane crew is doing exactly what they do best. And that's being who they are. Now, I I know the Gallaghers are both at at school now and they're they're busy in their lives. But uh, they weren't from Spokane. They were from Seattle. But did they, Mm -hmm. I, I honestly, this is me just being a geographic naive uh is spokane close to seattle and was there much crossover between the portland and the seattle and the spokane communities because i know that those are kind of all three hotbeds for a lot of the Pacific De- West. depending on how fast you drive you can get from spokane to seattle in about like four or five hours oh, um so give it is take. a bit of a distance it's a bit of a distance but you know four hours five hours is it really that long not really not and that's friendship. A, no, it well, you know, and you think about it's like, man, how many how many hours are you going to spend watching TV this week, you know, or something like that, or how many hours did you spend on grinding that trick last weekend, you know, when you really think about it in the grand scheme, sort of, per sec, uh, like uh, perspective, four hours, five hours, not that bad. Um, and then Portland, yeah, is is closer to about six hour drive, um, and you know, Washington especially back in the day was a breeding ground for just insane kendama players mm-hmm. i mean you got the wenatchee kendama team matthew ballard keith matsumura nick mayo and the like you've got the kedman's crew you've got gus carson's parker strom jason major max norcross Chaz edwards you've got the gallagher's you've got just you've got the steelacomb kendama team you get the tacoma Tunk kendama team you get all of these pockets and, of kendama and like you players. were saying not that far from standpoint idaho either so it's like the Pacific Northwest in general, like 
think in the northwest of the states just had so much of the early Kanoma influence. So much. So so many great Kanoma players came out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I think like what was a big part of that was especially back in the day at the very first battle in Seattle, um, that was the the first opportunity for all these Washington players, especially um, get the opportunity to like get together. Um, another big part of it was filming Count Me In with uh, the Wenatchee Kanama team because that was the first time that I had ever traveled outside of Spokane to play with Kanama with another group of people. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that was like the first time I ever played with another group of people. And then while we're there, I get to meet Wenatchee team. I get to meet the Edmonds crew. And it's like right there that the communication, the relationship is, is started, it's established. And then from there, it, it, it plays the roles that it plays. And um, so, yeah, there was a couple of key events that really led to a lot of that um, growth in Kendama. Uh, specifically in Washington. That's that's incredible. I like I picked up Kendama living in Saskatchewan, Canada, where there's maybe three other people in the world that knew what that was there. Yeah. And and you know, like there there was like hardly anyone else there that knew what it was, let alone could play it. Oh uh, man, what I would have killed to live in a place like Washington where driven like an hour or two or even heck three hours to go and meet people but for me like the closest hotbed of Kanoma players was Calgary at the time it was like that was like a seven eight hour drive for me I was like oh man I can't do that on a weekend <laughs> yeah no I, I I get it it's um you know when actually was only like two hours two and a half hours at the most away from here so I I lucked out I lucked out big time when it came to location maybe a little bit of luck, but also like a little bit of innovation from the people. It's like anyone can make that happen in their community around them, right? Like it just takes dedication from the group of people to start making something happen and it will spread. Mm -hmm. If you're at it for a long enough time and you're very invitational and welcoming to people, like people will come out. Uh, we're seeing it here in Calgary. We're seeing it wherever. It's like if you invest in a community and you build that, people will come over time. And, and I think there was just enough people that were in leadership in that area of, of the world of Kanama it just drew more people in and because there was so much going on it just started you know exponentially rising and it's like okay if you're a small town kid living out in the middle of nowhere maybe start small and build and who knows in 10 years you might be hosting your own comp i don't yep. know just stick at it get grow your skills develop do it. I, I i'm also i am a very firm believer in the idea that if people want to do something bad enough they will do it i and... drove 12 hours to nako Yes, like it, it, I am a very firm believer in that. And for something like Kendama, um, for new and experienced players alike, you you will eventually at some point make that long drive. It will happen. It just, it will. I'm, I'm absolutely stunned by the commitment people have made already to come to Brew Battle this year. This humble mm -hmm. little coffee fueled event and we have guys flying from Nash, like uh, Kentucky. We got the Soul homies coming. We got Kevin DeSoto from from Las Vegas. Yep. We have uh, Jacob Watts from California, and like a whole bunch of these other American homies. And not only that, like we have people flying from other ends of Canada, from Ontario, to come out here. Which people are like, "Oh, it's in Canada." That's 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 a twenty something hour drive if they were to drive. Right. It's, it's closer to come from California to, to Alberta to where we are than some of these guys are coming to get to us. Right. So it's absolutely insane. This. Kanama community has some whack individuals that will go to great lengths to go to a small jam. Uh, yes. People like relatively small. Uh, yes. You know, you know, 175 people or whatever. Like that's small for an event when you compare it to other industries. And it just blows my mind. Like it yeah. literally blows my mind. It's crazy. You'll send when you want to. Yeah. If you're committed, you're, you will do things that you never thought you would do for this game. If you want it bad enough, you'll get it. Um, we got a couple of questions from uh, a really amazing supporter of the show, Kenama Jinchiriki, uh, Patreon supporter. Love this guy to bits. Uh, and he's got a few questions. Um, he wants to know, what is your finisher in a game of Ken if you were playing someone? Do you have a go-to kill shot? Okay. So when 
that's that's actually an interesting question and if you guys haven't figured out at this point that i've got like a long-winded answer to even the most simple questions <laughs> like it, it's just like who i am i'm sorry but not at the same time so when it comes to ken I've, this is my my perception of the game over the years is that Ken is primarily played in two different ways. There's a play to win style and then there's a showcase style. Those are the two main ways that people play Ken. So play to win, obvious. You do tricks that you don't think the other person will be able to do and you are very confident in being able to do these tricks yourselves. So if I look at it through that lens, I usually will just do some shysty little thumb slinger tricks because there's such an obscure trick that aren't overly challenging, but you just don't see a ton of them. And if you sneak them into like little technical little moves, they can be a real pain in the ass in a game of Ken. So if I really want to play to win, I'll do some sneaky little sneaky snake sort of tricks like that. I don't really like playing that way. I kind of prefer the second way, which is um, showcase style. Now, showcase style, you will more commonly see uh, among very experienced Kendama players. Um, and showcase style is a lot more of a casual approach to Ken. And that is more of an opportunity for you to, well, quite literally showcase things that you like to jam things that tricks that you maybe want to show your buddy who you haven't seen in a while you want to show them this new thing that you've been working on or this is sort of the stuff that i excel at and it's a lot more of a casual approach to the game as opposed to putting it on a very um competitive level so it, it just kind of depends on on which lens that i want to view the game through and and it's usually the more casual approach but um there's always room for the competitive approach too. I, I think there's a third category too, which is uh, I'm going to try tricks that I've never tried before. And you're just like learning new tricks while you're playing because it's an excuse to learn them or like oh, tricks sure. that you've been grinding and you're like oh, sure. on the edge. Cause that's so many of my games of Ken where I play and I'm like, I know it's not a serious game. We don't really care who wins, but I'm going to do hard tricks that I've, I've like been grinding for. And then if I get them, we're like pumped. I know you're not going to hit it. Uh, because I've been working on this for weeks, but you know, whatever it is. And it's just like, it's really fulfilling for me to go for tricks that I know are just on the cusp of my reach in games again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely, that's definitely another approach. Um, okay. He's got two more questions here. He wants to know what are your favorite snacks to eat? Not healthy, not healthy snacks. to eat. He wanted to clarify just in case you're a health nut. He wants to know from both of us. The, the amount of, pepper jack cheese it's that i could put down in one sitting is, is horrifying absolutely horrifying I, I will put those things away put them in the dirt like those i could eat multiple boxes of those my other big one are the green tea kit kats that you get in japan oh, those are so not good i like i don't know if they're the same ones that i've gotten here i don't like them at all that is i'm sorry insane. I'm, that I'm is sorry. insane that's okay that offended you no none none taken and <laughs> you know none taken but that is the same exact thing the bag of those the, they don't see tomorrow it is done one and done that day does it bother you if people bite their kit kats like like a from the brick like just like take a bite out of it does that does that get on your nerves no i got other shit to worry about <laughs> <laughs> that, that drives some people insane i just i don't i don't care if i happen to know i have a kid I, I got other things to worry about in life i got other things going on like i don't care <laughs> trying to raise a human you can you can eat that kick out however you want brother like no problem uh, that's awesome um when you open a new kendama uh do you a do you buy a lot of new kendamas still um and then b what he wants to know what what's the first thing you do with a, a fresh kendama yeah um i i buy my fair share of kendamas still um i've gotten a couple of uh sweets kendamas recently and um, always just kind of like to buy other other little kendama related things. Um, I like to do that too, um, like stickers and and just other little pieces of art and things like that. 
I don't know. It, it kind of depends. Um, when I get a like a brand new fresh kendama, um, I usually just kind of like take a second to just kind of look at it, just give it a little bit of a scan, kind of see what I got myself into. And I don't really have like a set routine, to be honest, when uh, I get it. Like I said earlier, I once the kendama is in my hand, it's pretty much in control at that point. So um, sometimes I will just I don't I don't know. It, it's just kind of like uh, whatever happens at that moment. I have got like my little go to lines and things like that. I always like to sneak in a couple of crispy down spikes or just see how the lighty or the loony balance is a little bit and um, a couple of little generic things like that. But no, no real set routine, just whatever happens when it's in my hand happens. Awesome. I don't even know if I have like a go to. I think I do, a, I do whirl slings, I think, to find out if it's like uh, a slinger and then I'll probably like do a lunar thing. I don't know. Mm. I do like swivel toss to lunar to find out if it swivels hidden lunars usually. Oh, but yeah. Other than that, I don't think I have like a, I opened up a Kanama. What do I do first? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think about it that much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let, let's dive back in here and uh, let's talk about today uh, and, and what's going on in your world today. What is Dan Rose? role in Kendama now and then talk to me a little bit about what you're working on because I know there's something going on and I don't know what it is <laughs> unless so, you don't want to talk about it which you don't have to but I highly recommend you do <laughs> well kidding. so okay so nowadays with Kendama um you know during the more more uh I, I was doing some classes with the Sweet Kanamas Foundation uh, quite a while ago. Haven't done quite as much of that lately, but nowadays I I have been working on my own little project. Um, I I will dive into this a little bit. Um, I don't want to give away too much because I would really just prefer to have something really nice for you guys to see. Um, once you hear the whole story, but I will give you enough to at least um, just kind of give you a little bit of a peek behind the, the curtain. Um, so in January of 2021, uh, I made a New Year's resolution to document things more. Um, and this resolution really started uh, because of my daughter. And we have a baby book for my daughter. And we write down things like her first food, her first this, her first that, um, and all of these things that at the time you think you're going to remember, you really think you will, but then three weeks go by and that is just gone. That is somewhere in your subconscious. And it isn't until you go back and you read this baby book that you're like, I know exactly what happened that day. And so my resolution really was, how do I apply the same idea of documentation to Kendama? How do I apply this, this idea to something that I'm extremely passionate about? And so I started documenting things and I have gotten a very small handful of people to help me out with this project. And what this project really focuses on is is documentation um, and a really reliable, credible source for experienced and new Kendama players alike to go to and know that the information that is there um, is credible, it's informative, and hopefully a little entertaining. Um, you know, documentation has this really, really interesting way of transporting you back to moments in time if not for just a moment where you you go back and you think who was there at this time and then when that memory is is sparked you go back there and that is one of the most amazing things about documentation is the ability to look back at things and go back to that moment just very briefly um, and that is a really, it is really, really fun unlocking things in your, your, your mind that you kind of forgot were there. And I'm hoping that some, some of this documentation will do that for some people. 
That's so cool. That's awesome. I love documentation because it helps to build the longer story for people to participate in. You know, as new players as they enter in, trying to wonder like, oh, has this been done? Or oh, what was it like before I played? All that, you know, in until recent and until some of the documentation that's been done, you know, if there's a new site that Maybe you're familiar, maybe you're not. Uh, the Kenama World Records website that's mm-hmm. been you know, posted and started to grow. Like, I think stuff like that is so helpful. And building better systems for, for like data in the community mm-hmm. helps to build our community's foundation even more. When you, when you, and when you really get down to it, you start thinking about documentation and podcasts fall into that category of documentation without a doubt and when you really really start to analyze it and you really want to put a label on what these individuals are they're historians that is what it is and um podcasts um like this and dominards bell's advocates in some way shape or form i feel like that is a historian approach to how how what we're bringing to the table or what you're bringing to the table for the Kanama community. And I, I think that's important. Agree. I think that's, yeah. I think that's really, really important to be able to look back and acknowledge things and, and, you know, just look back on, just look back and not forget things because as time goes on and as the technological age becomes more prominent and we become more reliant on it, things are going to inevitably get buried I mean, things just get buried. If you want an example, if you've been playing Gundama for a long time or, or whatever, go back to like one of your early edits or one of your early posts or something like that. I I'd, almost, rather, I'd rather not look at those. <laughs> you know what though? I, I almost guarantee you will go back and you will find a trick and you'll be like, I completely forgot about that. And I, it's oh, something- I have done that. You know, and it's something that you've done. And as time goes on, that stuff is only going to get more and more buried by the mountains of content that are being thrown at us every single day. So write, it's, it's simple, write it down, write it down in a place that people can go to so it won't be forgotten. And not only that, like not to just forget it, but like go back and relearn and, and yeah. again. Like similar to the story that you were telling earlier about you know Kenko, you don't want to forget that. You don't want to forget right. that story because that story has shaped you into who you are today. And same with the journey that you've been on with Kanama and those tricks that you learned early on. Like make make note of those moments. You know your first lunar or whatever, and yeah. and it, you know journey on that. I remember I was so stuck on lunars for so long. Oh and yeah. There was one friend who was at college with me who was like a closet Kanama legend. He was really good. <laughs> And, and he like showed me one day and it clicked and I was like, this changed everything for me for this. Moment. Right. And I finally got my first lunar and you know, whatever it was, it's like, there was just moments that I, you know, remember, but I don't want to lose track of those. And I think as new players are developing, like take note of your progress, take mm-hmm. note of the journey you've been on because, you know, 10 years back or 10 years from now, when you look back, it'll be so beautiful to see that story in a written format or in some other format exactly exactly you'll be able to to relive those moments you know just briefly as much as i hate listening to myself after the podcast when i'm editing i i think you know in future it'll be really cool for me to go back and listen to an episode like this and and just hear what my you know naive perspective on kanama was 10 years back Uh, you know 10 years from now and be like oh i was an idiot (laughs) yeah i didn't know know anything but 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 i kind of want that right i want to see my own Totally okay with being humbled by my own growth. Yeah, and it and it helps you appreciate things too. Helps you appreciate things a little bit more. You know, there's there's something about going back and watching an edit from 2011 and and seeing someone play like an Ozora or a Shin Fuji or a, or a TK or hell even a Sunrise. There's something about that where you're like, you know, I have a little bit of a uh, uh, a little bit of different type of respect in in terms of this kanama play because i know for a fact the kanama that you're playing with right now is not the same as what we're playing with nowadays so you know it it, it gives you a little bit of that um that perspective that inc- that incredibly important thing called perspective well we've been riffing for about an hour and 45 minutes here and i don't want to take us too much uh 
past that two hour mark, mark if we can. So uh, maybe in the last you know, five, 10, 15 minutes here, talk to me about what you see coming down the pipe from Kanama as you've watched Kanama, you know, as you mentioned, like go in the cyclical cycle. Uh, what do you see coming down the road for Kanama in the next maybe year or two? Now, so here's here's pretty much like where I see it. It's hard for me to determine year or two, to be honest, because the way that my mind works, especially in Kendama, I see things in like five to 10 year categories where that's just kind of how I, I, I perceive it. So the next year or two, kind of hard to determine, especially because, you know, in-person events are somewhat coming back, but they aren't quite there. So let's just say, let's go for like five the next years. five, sure. let's say five years. Over the next five years, I, I still think we're going to see exponential growth in Kendama. Um, a lot of uh, people on podcasts have talked about uh, different sects of uh, people that are learning about it because of um, hobbies that they're into, like uh, EDM music or skateboarding or BMXing or, or rock climbing or, um, you know, the OG contributors, the skiers, um, the rollerbladers. Um, I see there being a lot more growth. I, I can tell you a few things that I would like to see. It's hard for me to determine what will happen, but I'll tell you a few things that I'd like to see. I would like to see more Kendama events that have more dynamic personalities. And this personality thing, I just keep finding myself working my way back to this whole personality thing because I think, you know, Kendama is just such an expressive art form. And it's such an expressive and at times like immersive thing for, for someone to watch and be a part of and to perform. And, and that's why I think personality is so important in this game. And I think every aspect of Kendama has personality, including events. Okay. So you look at NACO, for example, North American Kendama Open personality of that event is if you want to be the best of the best, especially here in the U S you come here and you put you you put it all on the line and you complete at NAC you you compete at NACO. Okay. That's the personality of the event. Pretty brutal trick list, more or less. A couple of easy ones, a lot of hard ones, and a lot of meta-oriented tricks. That is NACO's personality. Okay, so then we go to Van Jam. Van Jam, incredibly laid back, couldn't be more opposite of NACO laid back ken style have a drink if you try too hard you know don't try hard this is a, like a very relaxed style of of kendama play and this is like a very almost informal kendama event and i love that about the personality of the event because it's that personality of the event that is going to want people to go to it it's kind of, I, from what I've gathered, it was like somewhat of a controversial event way back in like 2018 or so, I think is about the time. But personally, I think this event personality is great. And that's Dama to the death. I think that is such a fun. Oh, I, I love it. I, I think, think it it's is so, so cool. fun. I think it is so fun. I think it is a great sort of personality trait for this event to have where it's like you kind of want to take it seriously but at the same time i mean it's games of ken it's kind of a really fun little ceremony that you have at the end so you don't really want to take it too seriously and it's just something like really unique that makes that kendama event fun and and desirable to attend and you know in the future i'd love to see uh, I know like timelines are a big problem and this is why this doesn't happen very often, but I'd love to see more round Robin Kendama events. I would love to see more freestyle centric Kendama events. I know that catch and flow is pretty much like the primary freestyle event in the Kendama world. But I think having one of those here in the United States, I mean, I, I mean, I guess for now you could say that NACO is the the big one with that but even that i feel like there's more focus on the open division 
So I want to see more of that. Um, I'm, I'm all for these more like experimental Kendama events and really just experimental Kendama anything because it's like, why not? Why not just explore all these other avenues? Worst case scenario, it doesn't work out and you try something different the next year. You know, it's, it's it, take those risks. Show that personality. Don't be afraid to show your personality through your event. Don't try and fit the standard of, of what you think Kendama events should be. Just fit the standard of what you want it to be. And from there, the process will take over and it will become something great. Hey, my man, I, 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 I hear that uh, so loud and clear. And I, I agree. Uh, one of the things that when we started Brew Battle or when you know, I, I concepted the idea to, to host this event, it's like, I wanted it to, to not be an, a, a competition. I wanted it to be a party that you're showing up to, you know, a yeah. wholesome community that happens to have an event, but really you're coming to see the people and you're coming to drink coffee and be in a present with everybody. And once you've you know, paid your admission, like everything inside is free for you. The coffee's free. There's going to be snacks, there's food, whatever. Like just, just come and celebrate with people and just come and hang out. And exactly. if you want to compete, just come and compete. There's a you know competitive bracket, a competitive open division competition freestyle. I wanted freestyle to be a part of it because I think freestyle actually brings more community because you get to see people showcase uh, uniqueness yes. and individuality. And I love freestyle more than I love open division. Freestyle this- is the dopest, dude. I like, think, yeah, there's, I agree. there's no doubt that freestyle is the dopest shit that you can yes. see at a Konami competition. It's it's there's, the best. It is the best. It, um, in MKO, my first year, DJ Panic. Do you know who that is? Do you remember who that oh, is? Yeah. So he he rolls up and he like does this maneuver where he like puts his Ken between his legs and he gets down on his knees and he does this like hop over the Tama as it's like mm-hmm. doing uh, whatever. Do you, I don't remember what the game the was. Skip it. Like, yeah, skip it. He basically did skip it with the Tama and his Ken in between his knees. I was like, what the frick is he doing? That's yep. so cool. And yep. I lost it. I thought it was so unique and so wonderful and like whatever it is, but freestyle, freestyle was always a part of Kanama that I loved. And so at the event, I was like, I know that, you know, my first year, we're not going to have the world's best players here, but I want there to be a dope freestyle event that people can partake in. And this year I'm like, we have dope freestyle people coming out to come and compete. And what I wanted to do on top of that was add in another freestyle format, which was adding a seven to spike championship on the night before mm-hmm. that's a total opt-in thing you can just show up be a part of it and it's judged by our freestyle judges so that anybody who shows up who just wants to get up there and do a performance do a run just like perform and mm-hmm. have that moment on the final stage at a low risk just fun environment like i wanted that to be the vibe i wanted to be that way and I, I, I think I think another thing too is like when we ask these questions and like discuss what we want to see in the future and you know what tricks we like to see and what kendamas we like to play, you know, it's it's putting us in that position where you have to start drawing lines. And that is something that isn't very common in Kendama. There are not a lot of hard lines drawn when it comes to Kendama. There's a couple like don't hand your shit don't use your other hand to fix the string. And then aside from that, it's pretty much whatever you want to do. And that whole idea is across the board with so many things in Kendama that, you know, you need to, you need to draw some lines at some point. And I know it's like a little off topic, but you know, it's all interconnected in some way, shape or form. And, and I, I guess like what it really comes down to is there is, infinite possibilities with kendama and it's not just the tricks and and that's just the best way to explain it heck yeah i i think that there is also like you know not to like the caveat what, what what we were saying i think there's actually a place for standardization too especially as we grow our competitive scene where all of a sudden you know neko or neko uh, is is you know this behemoth of an open division you know best of the best I want to see a world where there's more comps like that, that funnel into NACO, where we mm-hmm. can see, you know, these regional comps. Regionals. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I want to see that too. But at the same time, I want to hold on and retain the heart of the fun of Kendama, that it doesn't just evolve into some competitive beast where it's like, oh, I need to win my regionals so I can go to nationals. And then if I win there, then I go to the worlds or whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. But like, maybe just like also go to that one event that's hosted by your homie. Uh, Kevin DeSoto for his birthday where it's mm-hmm. you know 
which is a crazy event. That's awesome. Like that's one of the events that I really want to go to is Kevin's B Day battle. Like I think that's one of the dopest events out there. Oh that's yeah. That's one of the ones I want to go to. Part you know, of the reason I hosted mine was it was on my birthday in, you know, inspired by him. It, it's and what it really I also think that um really plays into is the idea that when you when you bring a pie to to dinner, you bring a pie to the table, you bring a cherry pie. And after like the fifth cherry pie, you're kind of like, I don't really want cherry pie anymore. I kind of want a piece of pumpkin pie. That idea, it's like kind of a silly example, but what it really is, is like with these Kendama events and just things that you want to contribute to in Kendama in general, think of like what flavor that you're bringing to the table. And if you already see a whole bunch of those flavors on there, it wouldn't hurt to maybe try something else. And and that's what's going to keep the meal interesting. And that's not to say that if you want to replicate NACO, more power to you. You know, that is that is fantastic if that's what you want to do. Go for it. You can. And there's no reason why it may or may not be successful. Go for it. But the the, the point is, is that when you have unlimited options, how can you not want to explore every single corner of what you can do with Kendama? There's just too much stuff you can do, you know? Absolutely, man. Hey, Dan, I, I, I think this is such a good place to, to kind of put a bow on this. And I think there's so much good content in here that anyone who's you know, living in an epicenter of Kendama or living in the middle of nowhere uh, can take and do something with they can go and make something happen, whether or not that's starting up a local scene and growing that and building that, or at least uh, objectively starting to criticize their own journey or document it. Like there's so much good content in here from what you've given us in terms of wisdom. And, and what I'd love to do is kind of just ask if, if there's you know, some parting words of wisdom that you'd like to speak to the Kanama community. And then uh, I'll maybe say a few words to wrap up and, and we'll, we'll wrap up this episode, which has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on here. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for, for this episode and everything that, that you do for our community. It's, uh, this has been uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I cannot believe you've sat through me talking for like almost two hours now. That is, <laughs> I love that, it. That is absolutely insane to me. Um, <laughs> some of my closest friends would be like, fuck, man, that was a long talk with him. <laughs> um, you know, for, for my parting words with the Kendama community, just keep in mind that as you play Kendama, that there are many ways to become a master. There are so many ways to become a master and you, you can, you can carve that path, however you want to carve it. And just know that there are people who will support you and there's a lot more people out there that will support you and then ones that will bring you down. You just need to um, keep your eyes and your heart and your mind open and others will recognize that and, and be there. So become a master at whatever you choose to be and, and love the process. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on here onto the review for sharing a cup of coffee that you drank and my gin and tonic. I, uh, Thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart and from the community for the work that you've done in building us to where we are, uh, the work that you're currently doing, and for the wisdom that I think you you gave a lot of in this episode. I think that this is an episode a lot of people will really appreciate and value, especially those that listen to it. And I'm going to push people to listen to this one because you know I've I've gleaned a lot from it in terms of lessons that I think so many others need to hear and, and take into account but more than that i'm excited to see what the next five years look like and i'm excited to see what comes down the pipe from kendama and let you know let in five years from now we'll get you back on here and be like all right let's see if what d rose said <laughs> came to life oh. <laughs> <the> part two episode <laughs> i'll see you guys in five years <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll get you back on before then but seriously uh d rose thank you so much for coming on here and appreciate everything that you do in the community so on behalf of us thank you Thank you so much, Adam. Much love. We will catch you guys on the review next week as well. And by all means, if you are thinking about it and you're considering it, make sure to cross off those dates in your calendar for September 10th through 12th and make your way to Calgary, Alberta for Brew Battle 2021. 
you seriously aren't going to want to miss this event. It's one of the first in-person events of the year. That is one of the major events and Canada's largest open division. So come check it out. Come drink coffee with me. We'll have Onyx. We got Soul Coffee all weekend long. You name it. It's going to be a good time. And we hope to see you there. With that said, thank you guys for listening and enjoy your coverage.